Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Shortliff. I'm the Deputy Director for the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Nahan this morning as our featured speaker for the fourth NCAM Integrative Medicine Lecture of 2014. Dr. Nahan received his PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MPH specializing in epidemiology from the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. He began his NIH career in 1985 as a postdoctoral research fellow at the National Institute of Dental Research. Dr. Nahan joined NCAM in 1996, when at that time it was the, uh, just the fledgling office of alternative medicine. And his valuable contributions to NCAM over the years have been recognized with three NIH Director's Awards. Since joining NCAM, Dr. Nahan has held key positions within the center, and he is currently serving as the advisor, senior advisor to the director of NCAM. One of Dr. Nahan's current responsibilities to, is to provide oversight of the design, implementation, and analysis of supplements to the National Health Interview Survey and the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey on complementary health approaches. Today, Dr. Nahan will discuss how surveys and other research approaches offer a comprehensive look at complementary health trends in the United States. He will give an example from a variety of data sources, including surveys of the public and health professionals, marketing and sales data, data from the NCAM Clearinghouse, data from professional associations, insurance data, Google Trends data, and structured interviews. The title of his presentation is The Blind Men and the Elephant, Survey Perspectives of Complementary Health Approaches. Please welcome Dr. Nahan. Uh, before I begin, I, I'd like to acknowledge the many people who've helped contribute to the data I'm going to be showing. Um, Allison Sofer from NCAM's own clearinghouse, uh, Patricia Pat Barnes, Tanya Clark, and Lindsay Jones from the National Center for Health Statistics, Jennifer Paragoy from the CDC, and our own Barbara Stussman from NCAM. So uh, this talk is about the blind man and the elephant. Uh, I think all of you have heard this story. Uh, a group of blind men are brought before an elephant. Each blind man touches a different part of the elephant, the ear, the, f the feet, the trunk, the tail, and each one gives a different description of the elephant. <clears throat> and in the happy ending of the story, they all come together and, and put their knowledge together to actually describe the full elephant. And so I sort of see complementary health approaches as analogous to this elephant. It can, it, depending on how you look at it, you're going to get a different point of view. And what I'm showing on this slide here is different ways you might look at these data. And unless you actually integrate the data from across different sources, you'll never get the full picture of the elephant. So what I'm going to try to do today uh, is try to describe the elephant in, for one question of the elephant. Are there changes in complementary health approaches over time? I shouldn't be doing that. And I'm going to take a worldview. I'm going to start with the worldview, and then we'll work down more narrowly as the lecture goes on. So on this first slide, I'm showing data from surveys across the world. These are surveys asking the public in these countries, did you use complementary health approaches or specific therapies? And you can see it goes from a low of about 5% in Israel in 1993 to a high of about 85% in Nigeria in 2006. Now, if you squint your eyes real hard, you might actually see there's a positive trend over time, and you can actually draw a regression line, a best-fitting regression line through this. But you can see around this line, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of surveys above the line, a lot of surveys below the line. So let's see if we can understand what's causing some of this variance. So what I'm going to do in the next three slides is illustrate some of the different characteristics of these surveys. In this first slide, I've highlighted those surveys that queried about more than 15 types of complementary health approaches. And you can see in this case, for these surveys, they tend to be in the top half of, of the prevalence rates. So in other words, a lot of questions on the survey, a lot of questions about these approaches tends to increase the prevalence rates you see. 
Now here I've highlighted those surveys that included vitamins and minerals in the definition of complementary health approaches. Now that sometimes this is done, sometimes it's not done. And you can see here again for the most part, uh, these surveys tend to be or have very high prevalences, though you can see a couple of outliers, those two circled blue squares uh, around 2000. Uh, these are all from Ireland, and so it might be something specific about Ireland um, that vitamins really aren't used a lot there. Now in this last slide, or in this last slide looking at these data, I've highlighted those surveys that included only practitioners of complementary health approaches. So there was acupuncturists, chiropractors, homeopaths, and in this case, you see that these surveys restricted to practitioners is on the lower half of the prevalence rates. So hopefully you can see that depending on the characteristics uh, of the survey you're actually looking at, you can get very different prevalence rates. And this is not only internationally, but nationally. And here I've highlighted the U.S. surveys. You can see there's a great deal of variance from 10% up to 80%. Uh, and again, what's explaining this variance? We're going to look at this in a little bit more detail. So in this case, I've color-coded the different surveys in the United States by different characteristics, and we'll go through these. So first, I wanted to highlight the fact that in the center, there's a group of surveys that are run between 30 to 40 percent. This seems to be what, where most of the survey prevalence rates are occurring in the United States. And as you can see, these are all red squares, which means they did not include deep breathing exercises within the definition of complementary health approaches. Now, looking at the high-end outliers, you can see that they're 60, 70, 80 percent, depending on, uh, on what was included in the survey. If you included prayer or, or vitamins, you tend to drive the prevalence rate up very high. And you can look at some of the low outliers. This particular survey I, I've circled, this only included practitioners, again, acupuncturists, chiropractors. And as I showed internationally, this really reduces the prevalence rates overall. And the final outlier only included four therapies. And as I sort of indicated before, the more therapies you look at, the higher the prevalence rates tend to go. So this sort of explains some of the variance here. But to make it even more interesting, within a given survey you could have variance depending on how the researcher wants to define complementary health approaches. So for instance, in 2002, using the same data, data set, investigators have reported prevalence rates of 32%, 36%, and 62%, depending on what they're including in the definition. So you've got to be very careful when you're comparing across a particular article to another article to make sure they're really comparing like to like. And the best way to make sure you are comparing like to like is to look at individual therapies. And that's what I'm going to be doing through the rest of the talk. I'm going to be concentrating on th three therapies, acupuncture, chiropractic, and non-vitamin, non-mineral dietary supplements, which is, as its name implies, all dietary supplements except vitamins and minerals. So looking at these mini elephants, again, I'm going to look, bring in a lot of different types of surveys and types of information, not just public surveys, but clinician surveys, Google Trends, marketing insurance data, etc. And we'll see how these things compare and contrast. So this first slide is showing, again, this is survey data. Surveys I've already shown you, but looking specifically at acupuncture. We we'll look at trends over time, and the y-axis. Here we're looking at the percent of the population who used acupuncture. And here are the data. Now, for acupuncture, the questions are very similar across surveys. Did you see a provider for acupuncture? That seems to be the, tenet, the general tenet of all these questions, and so you can compare these data. And again, there seems to be a very clear trend over time. So we want to get some, you know, we always want to look at colla uh, collaboratory data from other sources. So in this case, we're going to look at Google Trends. So I don't know if any of you have used Google Trends. It's an analytical tool in Google. And what it does is it produces relative um, densities uh, of, with which a search term is used. So for instance, here, I'm showing mapping of the search term acupuncture. The darker the color of the state, the more acupuncture is used in that state versus other states. And this is um, because it's, it's um, calculated as the, really the, the percent of acupuncture use as a search term versus all search terms within that state. Um, it it's, uh, accounts for differences in the populations across states. So what you can see is the West Coast is very high. People in the West Coast are searching a lot for uh, using the term acupuncture. 
There's also a great deal of searching in Colorado, New York, Massachusetts, and a little bit less in Florida. So here's the data in 2012. And you can see now a number of new states have been pulled in and are now searching uh, using acupuncture as a term. You can see there's uh, additional states in the West, additional states in the Midwest, and in fact, all of the East Coast, all states in the East Coast, people are using this as a term. Now the fact that they're using acupuncture as a search term doesn't mean they're using acupuncture, they're going to an acupuncture. We don't know why they're looking for this term, but, it, but what Google states is that this is an indication of the interest in this topic. So they're interested in acupuncture, we know that. We also know that there's an increased use. We don't know yet which comes first. So if there's increased um, use of the search term acupuncture and there's increased use of acupuncture by the public, it poses the question, has there been a change in the number of acupuncturists over time? And here we're looking at data from the American Association of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. And what they're plotting here is the number of acupuncturists in thousands over a number of years. And so here's the data. You can see that in 1992, there are a little bit more than 5 million acupuncturists in the United States. By 2009, this jumped tremendously to almost 29 million um, acupuncturists. Thousand, thank you. And what I'm showing here is I've um, superimposed on that prevalence slide using the, uh, showing the number of um, people using uh, acupuncture in the surveys. And you can see that the area of the highest increase in acupuncturists between 94 and 2009 is also an area of very steep increase in the prevalence of use. Again, we don't know whether the availability of acupuncturists led to more use or the demand for acupuncturists led to more acupuncture. We don't know the, the, the area of causation. So if acupuncturists are increasing in the United States, where are they located? Now, in this case, we're looking at the data from the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Orient Oriental Medicine. These are the people who license acupuncturists in the states that do license acupuncture. And so what they're plotting here is of all acupuncturists, where they reside, and on the x-axis, we see they've broken the country into six geographic regions, the far west, northeast, on down to the west, south, central. And so here's their data. You can see that 35% of acupuncturists are located in the far west, about 26%, uh, 24% in the northeast, on down to the west, south, central, where only about 4 or 5% are located. And what we can do again is we can compare this to the Google trend data. Now if you look at these maps, you see this considerable overlap. And in fact, you can see uh, what I'm doing now in the Google Trend data is, is actually circling the areas that correspond to uh, the commission's definitions of the geographic region. So you can see that in the far west, uh, almost all the states ha have high use except for Idaho, and, uh, no, uh, Wyoming, and Dakota, no, thank, Montana, thank you. Uh, we see in the um, Northeast, there's been a large increase, as we already said, in New England. In fact, that drives the increase in the Northeast here and a large number of acupuncturists. Uh, working down to the South, South Central, which is really the Southern Pacific um, states. Uh, the East, North Central, which is really driven by the use in Michigan. Uh, the West, North Central, which is really driven by the use in Minnesota. And finally, the West, South Central, Texas and its accompanying states, which is both very low um, in prevalence and very low in acupuncturists. So I'm going to bring in another type of tool that again lets you look at how people or what people's interests are. Uh, you can think of the clearinghouse. NCAMP's clearinghouse, as it states on this slide, serves as the public's point of contact for scientifically based information on complementary health approaches. And the clearinghouse tracks in inquiries from the phone, fax, mail, email, and social media. And then they produce uh, their own uh, data tools that they can then search, and they've done these searches for me. And so what I'm plotting here is both the um, prevalence data, survey data, looking at the number, a percent of adults using acupuncture on the left-hand graph. And then on the right-hand graph, I'm going to show the clearinghouse data. And I'm going to show data for both acupuncture, and then as for comparisons, I'm going to be showing data for naturopathy, homeopathy, and massage therapy. So here's the data for acupuncture. As a, uh, in the left-hand slide, I've already shown you earlier that there's an increase in 2000, 
2002 to 2012 in that large map, in that large graph. Uh, and you can also see there's a corresponding increase in the number of inquiries about acupuncture to the clearinghouse. Uh, here's the data for naturopathy. As maybe many of you know, naturopathy is only licensed, I think, now in 15 states or so. So that's going to keep the prevalence down versus acupuncture. But you can see there's still been a significant increase over time in the survey data as well as in the clearinghouse data. Uh, here's data for homeopathy. Again, there's been an increase in time uh, for both people using homeopathy and inquiries about homeopathy. And here's data for massage therapy. You know, here's a, a divergence. Um, you can see that massage therapy is much higher than you might expect Look in, in the prevalence data versus the clearinghouse data. Uh, there's this strange peak in 2007 and then a drop then in 2012 for the prevalence data. We don't see that in, in the uh, clearinghouse data. Uh, where, so I'm cur currently trying to figure out what this is, what's, the, what's happening with the massage therapy data, but I don't have that yet. So, so far in acupuncture, in terms of the elephant of acupuncture, we've looked at the public surveys, clinician surveys, Google Trends, and the clearinghouse data. Next, I'm going to bring in insurance data. And this type of insurance data I'm going to show you is not about how much, is, uh, someone is, uh, how much insurance is covering something, but whether there is coverage. And so the first data I'm going to show you is from the Kaiser Family Foundation that periodically will do a survey of employers and ask the employers what kind of health insurance do they provide their employees. And they specifically ask in a certain number of years whether acupuncture was one of the options in the insurance coverage. Now, this excludes employers such as Microsoft or General Motors that have in-house insurance, health insurance for employees. It also excludes uh, government workers, whether state, local, or, or federal. So this is not necessarily a nationally represented sample. It's just of these types of employers. So here are the data. You can see from, uh, two, from 1998, about 15-17% of employer-based plans included coverage for acupuncture. And this increased to almost 50% in 2006. So as you might imagine, as coverage for acupuncture increases, they, this reduces the economic burden of individuals, which might be part of the drive for increased use. People don't have to pay so much, and then they can then go see their acupuncturist. But then there are these are contradictory data that we're getting from the National Health Interview Survey, and that's shown here. In both the 2002 and 2012 NHIS, if someone used acupuncture, we then asked them, well, did you have insurance coverage for the acupuncture? And that's what these data are about. So you can see in 2002, 35%, about 35% of people who used acupuncture said they had health insurance that covered the cost, at least some of the costs for the acupuncture. But this dropped substantially in 2012. Here we see only 25% of individuals who used acupuncture said they um, Work had coverage. So this is sort of contrary to increased use. And so, but you have to, um, going back, I pulled up here the data from the Kaiser Foundation looking at the employers. You can see that those data only go through 2006. So it could be that after 2006, if they do this survey again, we might actually see a decrease in employer-based uh, employer coverage. But right now, it looks like, according to the NHIS data, that there is less coverage over time. So, a mini review of acupuncture. We've seen an increase in public use. We've seen an increase in public interest. We've seen an increased number of licensed acupuncturists. And perhaps this a decrease uh, in insurance coverage over time. Again, I'm waiting to the next Kaiser survey data that comes out to really uh, say that's true. So we're going to move on to our next topic, which is chiropractic. Now here again, I'm showing data from surveys looking at the use of chiropractic. Uh, these are actually the same surveys that looked at acupuncture, too, for the most part. Uh, and what you can see here is that in the mid-1990s, there's a lot of variation in what the prevalence data is telling us. It went everywhere from 2% of people using chiropractic to a high of almost 16% of, of people using chiropractic. So again, what we want to do is look at some of the characteristics of these surveys and try to understand what's causing this variance. So the group that I've just circled, those are surveys that ask the question, did you use chiropractic? Okay. Now among that group, this very high outlier, around 16%, was a random male survey. 
All the other surveys on this slide are either in-person surveys or telephone surveys. Mail surveys often have a much lower response rate. People may only respond to actually have used chiropractic or complementary health approaches. So this might be driving the prevalence rate up. Now this out, low outlier had the most specific question. Uh, the people were asked, what type of medical, medical provider did you talk to on this healthcare visit? This is part of the medical expenditure panel survey. People were asked in the last week, did you see a healthcare provider? And then if they said yes, they were asked this question, what kind of provider did you see for that visit? And chiropractic was one of the possible choices. Now, because this is in a fairly short prevalence uh, time period of a, of a week, and because um, there's a specific list of providers, this might be driving the, the use down. Uh, in 2000, I guess that's 1999, actually, uh, the National Health Interview Survey asked the question, did you see a chiropractor for your usual care? So it's very specific care, and what kind of care you're receiving from the chiropractor. In 2003, this survey asked, did you see a practitioner for chiropractic care? It's not usual care, but for chiropractic care. And then 2007 and 2012, the NHAS asked the question, did you see a practitioner for chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation? So it's now very narrowing down to a specific type of procedure. And most people, we were giving them the option with that 90% of the people responded to chiropractor, not osteopath, when we asked them, who they were seeing. So because of the great uh, divergence of definitions used in these surveys, it's not really appropriate to compare across. So we really don't want to look at a, a trend using these data. Now there were a few surveys that were repeated over time. David Eisenberg and his colleagues fielded almost the identical survey in 2001 and 2007, and those are highlighted in green. And, and the NHIS uh, fielded almost the identical surveys in 2007 and 2012, and those in blue. And so when you're looking at a fairly identical surveys, you see that the prevalence rates are quite, quite close together between the pairs. There's a 1% increase uh, for David Eisenberg's survey over a five-year period and a slight decrease in the NHIS. So this suggests that when there are changes in chiropractic, they tend to be fairly narrow. They're not these big changes we're seeing on, on this slide here. But because of these short time periods, five years, six years, for these pairings, we can't really look at long-term trends. So again, we're going to want to look at alternate sources of data, and we're going to look at big data. Uh, again, Google, have already, Google Trends have already uh, introduced you. That's an incredibly big data set. And Medicare, the Medicare beneficiary data, is also another big type of big data that can be mined. So again, we're going to now look at uh, Google Trends with using chiropractic as a search term. But instead of looking at differences among states, we're going to show differences over time. And so here are those data. Uh, we can see that there was a small increase in 2004 to 2006. There was a large increase from 2010 to 2012. But then for most of this period, it was relatively flat. From 2006 to 2010, there's really no difference uh, among the use of chiropractic as a search term. So the question is, we want to see if, if we can find other data that would support these data. And so we're going to turn to Medicare beneficiary data. Um, now again, when you're looking at Medicare data, you're not looking at survey data. You're not asking people what they use. You're looking at the claims data. What are people submitting, uh, or what are physicians submitting to Medicare for reimbursement? So it's a very different type of data. Uh, we did an all uh, up at Dartmouth had done a, a number of analyses looking at chiropractic use using these types of data. So I'm going to be presenting a fair amount of, of, of his data. In this particular slide, they estimated the number of beneficiaries who used chiropractic in a given year, and, and the scale is in millions. And in the right-hand um, part of the graph, they're going to be plotting, it says here, the percentage of all Medicare Part B beneficiaries that use chiropractic care. In other words, looking at the prevalence of chiropractic care among Medicare beneficiaries. And so here are the data. Um, first looking at the gray bars, which are the estimated total number of chiropractic users. You can see there's a small increase from 2002 to 2005. It goes from 1.6 million in 2002 to about 1.8 in 2005. So 200,000 additional people started using chiropractic in this period. And a small decrease of about 100 
thousand people between 2005 and 2006. When they looked at the prevalence data, they saw a very small increase in the prevalence between 2003 and 2005, 0.2% um, increase. And then from 2005 to 2008, it was flat. And so their conclusions, uh, Whedon and his co colleagues' conclusions, was that over this time period, there was really no change in the use of chiropractic. It, it's flat. Now, they also did mapping. Um, using type, these types of data. And here they're looking at the density of chiropractic in different states. And as you can see here uh, in the legend, what they're looking as, at is the number of users per 100,000 Medicare beneficiaries in the state. So again, this is a way to, to account for differences in population sizes across the states. And you, you can see um, the darker the color, the more people are using it. It goes from a low of seven um, beneficiaries per 100,000 to up to 204 beneficiaries per 100,000, so about 20% um, prevalence rate, if you, if you want to calculate it. So you can see it's much higher than in the Midwest than any place else. It's also high in Rocky Mountain states, very low in the South comparatively. So here is actually uh, returning to NHIS prevalence data. Uh, here we've mapped out um, the prevalence of chiropractic by nine census regions indicated here. Um, what we did is the color coding for this slide is we compared the prevalence rates in each of these regions to the overall national average. If a region had a prevalence rate lower than the national average, it was coded light blue. If it had a rate higher than the national average, it was coded as dark blue. And then those that had no difference from the national average were coded in this middle color blue. And so here's some prevalence data. And what you can see that the national prevalence rate for chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation in 2012 was 8.5%. But if you look at the west-north central area, it's 16.4%. It's 90% increase over the national average. Very high. And in fact, it's significantly more than all every other region um, in the country, including the second highest, the mountain region, which had a prevalence of 11.4%. Now, the South was uniformly low, um, anywhere from 5.9 to 6.5 percent, much lower than the national average. Uh, here again, I've superimposed the data, Whedon's data, from Medicare. You can see there's a, a great deal of overlap, that the states that are high in prevalence tend to be high in Medicare beneficiary use. The states that are low in prevalence in the survey data are low in the, the Medicare beneficiary use. Another interesting but very simple analysis that Whedon and his colleagues did was to actually look whether the availability of chiropractors was related to the use of chiropractors. A simple question, and they answered it in a very simple but still elegant way. What they did is they created a scatter plot in which, this is state data, in which they, for each state, they plotted uh, the number of chiropractors per 100,000, per 1,000 beneficiaries. Again, this is to account for the uh, state differences in population. And then they correlated this with the chiropractic users per 100,000 beneficiaries, again, for each state. And so th these are the data. You can see a very clear linear trend. As the number of chiropractors goes up, the number of beneficiaries goes up. And in fact, you can relate it back to the prevalence data I just showed you for, for the NHIS. Uh, those states in the west, north, central, not only had high prevalence, they also had the highest density of chiropractors per state. Those states with the lowest prevalence, the southern states, also had the lowest density of chiropractors per state. So you can see there is a clear relationship between prevalence and the density of chiropractors within a given geographic area. So, chiropractic mini-review. Uh, we've seen relatively stable public use over time. We've seen recent increases in public use, and that's from the Google data. We've seen large regional variations in public use, with a big outlier being the north central um, Midwest. And we've seen that public use is clearly related to the availability uh, of chiropractors. So moving on to, again, non-vitamin, non-mineral dietary supplements. Again, we're going to look at changes of these supplements over time. 
Uh, and here's the survey data. Again, this is almost the identical set of surveys we looked at for chiropractic and acupuncture. Um, here, this seems to be, a, again, a very clear li a linear trend in the uh, percent of the adult population that are using these supplements uh, increases over time. And a very interesting thing you can do with the dietary supplement data is you could actually compare it to sales data. Uh, sales data is tracked very closely by the nutrition industry, and they make that, public, that data publicly available on an annual basis. And so here I'm taking data from both survey data and from the uh, Nutrition Business Journal, which produces these um, data for sales, and I'm plotting them on, on the same slide. You're seeing on one scale, I'm, I'm again, I'm doing prevalence to percent of the adult population using these dietary supplements, while on the other scale, I'm plotting the sales of these dietary supplements in billions. So again, these are very different scales. So what I want you to look at is not the, the rate of incline or decline in the sales or in prevalence, but whether the sales are going up the same time as prevalence going up or whether they're going down the same time they're going down. So here again is the prevalence data. Uh, you've already seen those in the previous slide. And here's the sales data. So you can see is that initially there's very good um, trending. As the prevalence goes up, the sales data goes up in, in a, a very linear way. But then in 2007, something strange happens. The sales data continues to go up, but the prevalence data becomes very flat. So what I'm going to do in the next slide is to, next few slides is to try to understand what's going on here. Why is sales going up, but the public use is not changing? So to do that, I'm going to be concentrating on three survey years. Um, this is NHIS data again. We're looking at 2002, 2007, 2012. Uh, and you can see that in 2002, about 90% of the adult population was using these um, dietary supplements. Uh, this dropped in 2007 to a little bit under 18%, and it was fairly flat in, in 2012. Now, because of the um, very large sample sizes, um, the, the, both 2007 and 2012 were significantly lower than, than 2002. But again, let's, let's look at the characteristics of, of these data to make sure we're comparing like to like. So in 2002, uh, we asked the question, during the past 12 months, did you use natural herbs for your own health or treatment? And again, we provided no information to the uh, participant on what we meant by natural herbs. You didn't give them any kind of, of definition or examples. In 2007, we asked, during the past 12 months, have you taken any herbal supplements listed on this card? So we're specifying now that we're talking about, not about supplements, about supplements, not about teas or foods, and only things that are listed on a particular card. And then 2012 was a very similar survey. Um, during the past 12 months, have you taken any herbal or other non-vitamin supplements listed on this card? Here what we've added is the non-vitamin phrase, again, to make it very clear to people here that we're not talking about vitamins. These data also varied in how the follow-up questions were asked. In other words, after they said they used these supplements, we then asked, what were you using? So in 2002, we asked, what products did you use in the last 12 months? In 2007, we asked, what products did you use in the last 30 days? Big difference. And then 2012, we first asked, what products did you use in the last 12 months? And then we asked them of those products, which did you use in the last 30 days? So this means, of course, that we can compare 2002 to 2012, and we can compare 2007 to 2012, but we can't compare 2002 to 2007. Now, why is that? Well, here's data uh, from 2002 only, where we asked about 30-day prevalence and 12-month prevalence. And here's some data. So as you can see that in terms of the 30-day data prevalence, about 1%, a little bit less than 1% of the population used ginkgo within the last 30 days. And then as we move on to the right-hand side, it goes higher and higher until we reach omega, fat, omega fatty acids or, or fish oils. In this case, about 8% of the adult population said they used these products within the last 30 days. So here's the 12-month uh, data. You can see in each case, for each supplement, there's a large increase in the prevalence rates. And what I've added now is the actual percent increase from 30 days to 12 months. So you can see, for instance, for glucosamine, glucosamine or chondroitin, 27% uh, more people uh, reported yearly prevalence rate versus 30-day prevalence rate. 
And for omega-3 uh, fatty acids and fish oils, 37% more people responded to the 12-month rate versus the 30-day rate. But when you look to ginseng or echinacea, you see 143% difference and 167% difference, very large differences. So what might be the reasons for this? What's well, how these products are, are, are used. Ginseng and echinacea tend to be used for acute symptom management or uh, um, period of times having to do with seasonal diseases such as colds. Uh, someone who used echinacea uh, to prevent or manage the cold from December, January, February, if they were asked in August, did you use it in the last 30 days, they would say no. But if you asked, did you use it in the last 12 months, they would say yes. Other hand, glucosamine, chondroitin, and fish oil are used primarily to manage or prevent chronic disease. For glucosamine, for instance, it's used primarily, almost exclusively, for arthritis. If you have arthritis, you're going to use glucosamine for a long period of time. You're not going to use it for a week and then stop. Um, they say you have to actually use it for at least two months before you get even a, get a benefit. So this is going to um, reduce the difference between the 12-month prevalence and the 30-day prevalence. So because of this, I've chosen to only look at the 12-month prevalence. In this case, I'm comparing the data in 2002 to 2012. But because those differences in questions, again, I, I really shouldn't be looking at the overall prevalence rate. What I'm going to be looking at is specific supplements, and those data are here. So, for instance, between 2002 and 2012, there was a fairly substantial decrease in the prevalence rate of ginkgo biloba. Now, we like to say here at NCAM that this is due to some of our large clinical trials that show a negative effect, but um, I can't say that for sure. Uh, here we see a decrease in the use of ginseng, uh, a substantial decrease in the use of echinacea, a little bit of an increase in glucosamine and chondroitin, uh, a little bit of an increase in melatonin, and a substantial increase in fish oils. I mean, it really orders the magnitude for fish oil. <coughs> now, the thing to remember about overall prevalence in individual supplements is that they're not additive. It's not that you would add all these things together to get the overall prevalence. It's, did you use a supplement, yes or no? So if, you decrease, if the population decreases in the use of one supplement and decreases in, in another supplement, in fact, cancels, cancels out, so the prevalence rate would end up being the same. And that's what happened between uh, 2007 and 2012, for instance. Now here again, I'm going to turn to sales data from the Nutrition Business Journal. Um, that's on the uh, left-hand graph. Here, the scale is in millions, not billions, but in the prevalence rate is still as it was before. So here again, what we're looking at is directions of trends, not absolute magnitude of, of the slopes because the scales are so different. And we can see here, for things that decreased in terms of prevalence, we saw decreased sales, matching decreased in sales. For the things that increased a little bit in prevalence, we saw increases in sales. And for things that increased a lot in prevalence, uh, proportional basis, we saw very large increases in sales. So again, sales data, prevalence data are really go hand in hand when you look at the level of the individual supplement, if not um, the combination of all supplements. And again, Cost data are additive, so while the prevalence data may be flat because things are going up and down, you only counted once, you add, do add across all the sales data to come to a total. Uh, turning now to Google Trends, again, Google Trends here for individuals, individual supplements will tell you whether or not people are searching for the supplement. It doesn't tell you why they're searching for the supplement. And again, what we want to look at here is the directions of the trends, not the absolute slopes. So here, we can see a large decrease in ginseng in terms of prevalence and a corresponding decrease in the interest of the public as measured through Google Trends. Uh, we can see a decrease in glucosamine chondroitin over time and a decrease in the use of Google as a trends. Uh, we can see an increase in melatonin, an increase of, of use of Google, uh, of melatonin as a search term in Google. Uh, same thing for probiotics. And here, very large increases in both the use of fish oil as a search term, and fish oil by the public. So we saw now, so far, we've seen that prevalence goes up over time or for individual supplements, that sales goes up over time for individual supplements, and that uh, Google Trends tends to match nicely with, with the prevalence data. Here we're going to look at, we're going to look at here all supplements, but since I'm only looking at a given year, 2012, that, that's okay. And what we're looking at, again, is the prevalence across the geographic regions. And this is the same scale as before. 
Uh, light blue indicates a significantly less than the general um, prevalence rate, national prevalence rate. Uh, dark blue indicates it's higher than the national prevalence rate. So you can see here is the mountain states have a prevalence of uh, almost 29% in terms of use of these dietary supplements versus about 18% for the national prevalence. So that's an increase of more than 50% over the national prevalence rate. Uh, it's followed um, by the west, north, central region and the Pacific region, which have a 23% prevalence rate. These are both statistically less than you would see in the mountain states. And then the lowest area is the South Atlantic with 131 um, prevalence rate. But you notice the whole East Coast generally has low prevalence rates for dietary supplements. So the mini review for dietary supplements, we've seen that uh, supplement-specific changes in prevalence over time. We've seen changes in public interest mirrored by changes in both public use and sales. But again, we don't have an idea of the causation here. And we've seen wide geographic variation in, in public use. So this actually brings me to the end of, of my talk. Um, I don't expect you to remember all the individual data points that I've shown you. I, I threw a lot of data over time, and, and I hope you appreciate that it was really just to give you a sense of the way things are moving, not, not to look at the specifics. But I really want you to understand is that in order to understand the elephant that's complementary health approaches, you have to remember that if you're looking at prevalence data or sales data, that definitions can really drive interpretation of the data. Make sure you understand what the investigators are asking when you're trying to compare one data set to another data set. You should try to use as many sources of data as you can in order to really see if things are playing out across different aspects of the public. Again, you don't want to look at just the elephant's tusk or his toe. You want to look at the whole body. And finally, you have to consider new technologies as they become available. Google Trend is a great tool. Uh, I'm really enjoying using it. Uh, I think it, as they become more advanced in the technology, that, yeah, um, the searches they let you to do can be more, even more interesting. Uh, and I think we have time for questions. Um, this wasn't the focus of your talk, but early on you presented some global data, and I noticed that you had a good mix of like low and middle and high income countries. Yeah. Um, and in looking at that, what is the working definition of complementary medicine when in some countries they might not do supplements because they eat a bunch of fish, or um, some methods that we call complementary would be primary? Yeah. So when we look at complementary medicine globally, like what, how is the question being asked, and, and why? What is, what is our goal for understanding that? Uh, actually, I have a different slide set that sort of addresses that globally. Um, survey questions, even in developing countries, tend to follow what's been done in Europe and the United States. So they will ask questions very similar to what's in the National Health Interview surveys or s some surveys done in the UK, even though they aren't asking about their own traditional healer, so it's, it's, it's the dichotomy. So the data I'm showing actually is looking at very similar types of interventions. Um, obviously, the herbal medicines that are used in the United States are going to be very different than Uganda. Um, and most of those surveys don't break out by the individual supplement. But you can, you can assume they'd be very different. Now, uh, I've had this discussion with people around the world. If surveyors in their own countries were to include more traditional forms of that country, I'm sure the prevalence rates would be very much different. Um, but right now, they're not. I think it would look different. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I was curious about the, the wide variation in, um, or how, how much uh, acupuncture use has increased, but mm -hmm. also the, that Medicare or that um, insurance coverage has gone down. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if there's any data on the cost per treatment, because I know that there's been also a big trend in low-cost acupuncture that might be cheaper to pay out-of-pocket um, than even to ask for insurance coverage. Uh, oh, it's, it's in progress, that question. Um, we've already done an analysis looking at um, per-visit um, cost for acupuncture for 2007. We're, we're currently doing that for 2012 right now. Um, but in terms of global costs, um, there doesn't seem to be much difference in what people are paying totally. Yeah. 
is there any data on, I mean, I've just become aware of yeah. like community acupuncture clinics. Mm -hmm. They're charging, you know, maybe $20 per treatment. Is there any data on how, pre how um, prevalent those kind of centers are? No, the, none of the surveys can get that specific. Um, we, again, the question is, um, did you see a provider for acupuncture? We don't even ask what kind of provider it is. It could be an acupuncturist, it could be an MD, it could be a chiropractor or a naturopath. It's just someone is providing the acupuncture. And the insurance questions are, did, was there coverage for it? And then we look at how the coverage, we're looking at how the coverage affects um, out-of-pocket costs. Um, but we can't look at that specificity of where they're getting it. Okay. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, you show a number of different ways that the prevalence of the use of a variety of alternative therapies um, increases over time. But if we assume that uh, people are using these therapies to treat symptoms or some sort of health concerns that they may have, is there any evidence that symptoms or perceived health changes as we see these changes in use patterns? So, so you're asking if someone's using acupuncture, do we have evidence that the symptoms see, are going away? see these increases in use. Are symptoms or complaints or health problems changing along with those increases in? Uh, well, we actually just did an, an abstract uh, on this. Um, and what we measured is for each of the therapies we looked at, a number of therapies, whether there was a change in whether people were using specific therapy for treatment or management of a disease or for wellness. And what we found is that globally there was a, a move from treatment to the use of all these therapies globally for, for wellness, though there's some variation between individual um, therapies, of course. So it seems like people are moving away from using complementary health approaches globally um, to manage a specific disease versus making it more of a lifestyle part of their life to be, be healthy. Thing. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Richard? Couldn't resist. <clears throat> so in, in one way, and it's just sort of a follow-up to the last question. In, in one way, the use, the prevalence data is sort of people are voting with their feet, mm -hmm. kind of. S scenario, but we all and and we know again from the NHIS data that by far the largest condition for which people use complementary health is some sort of pain related treatment. Mm -hmm. But we also have data from and Rick Dio did a great presentation a couple of months ago where he showed that for uh, things like back pain and musculoskeletal pain in general the incidence or the prevalence of those conditions is actually going up over the last 15 to 20 years. And I'm just wondering whether this sort of increased use or prevalence of these complementary health approaches for treatment of pain-related conditions, could we get any sort of inference about whether, in fact, they're really being helpful based upon these sort of almost conflicting Sources of data, the you know vote with your feet a kind of approach versus right. the MEPS data showing it's the ins or the prevalence of these pain conditions is still going up. Right, we're actually doing that analysis now too. Um, what, in order to standardize across the years to account for the changes in prevalence of disease, instead of in the past we've always reported the percent of people who used complementary approaches who had back pain, or the percent who had depression, or the percent who used. Um, complementary approaches for their back pain or for their depression. This time, we're, we're reversing it. We're saying, what percent of people with back pain use these approaches? What percent of people with depression use these approaches? And so those data will be out sometime this summer. Um, that's all I can tell you now. You know, Brian, it's interesting to me that you interpreted this data as suggesting the increased trend. Actually, I, I look at all this data and say, more or less, use patterns are remarkably stable. Mm -hmm. we, we see some local and uh, change in patterns of use that Richard didn't show the data on yoga. There's a lot more yoga. On the other hand, the dietary supplement use is really remarkably stable. The chiropractic use is remarkably stable. Uh, so it, 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 there are some modest changes. Right. Question from that. All right, thank you. Um, 
my question is, uh, what is the attitude of the medical practitioners, you know, uh, towards yeah. the changes that you're seeing? I actually had that slide initially in, and then I took it out because it seemed not connected enough to the other stuff. But there's actually been a number of surveys looking at physician opinions of different complementary health approaches, and I had presented, I was going to present a slide looking at acupuncture. And what you see, what I, what I was going to show in that, is that it depends on the type of physician. For instance, um, in terms of acupuncture, uh, pediatrician uh, opinions of acupuncture have increased dramatically over the last 15 years when the surveys were done. Uh, rheumatologists were flat, surgeons were flat. So it depends on, on who you're looking at. Um, they all have different experiences with their patients. Uh, they're getting these, I, I'm, I'm guessing that their impressions are not so much from reading the literature, but from what their patients are bringing to them. Oh, I go to an acupuncture to help me. And I guess um, as there's been an increase in acupuncture use among kids, they're bringing it more to the pediatricians, and that's making the pediatricians more favorable. Uh, the rheumatologists look at things like glucosamine and chondroitin, and it seems to be neutral data. So that hasn't really changed their views. But um, I could, um, I guess uh, when we do, we're going to post this eventually. I guess I could include that slide in, in the set that's posted. Wendy. Hi, great talk. Um, I think I, you didn't talk at all about any of the limitations. You talked about some of the mm. how to compare across different surveys, but you didn't talk specifically about the limitations of the cross-sectional nature of the data, and I wonder if you could mention that, and then whether or not you have any longitudinal data that could be used from these national surveys. Yeah, um, on cross-sectional data is a point of time. So, so you really don't have, looking at just the initial data set, you really have no longitudinal data, um, which is a limitation, because you can't talk about causation as all. As I was saying, we could see correlations, so we can't talk about causation. Um, some surveys, like the NHIS, are linked to data sets that allow you to look at longitudinal data, like the NHIS is linked to the Medical Expander Expenditure Panel Survey, so you can follow people over a two-year period uh, on what they're using and how much they're spending. Um, NHIS is all, also linked to the Medicare data set, so for at least for the people in that population, you can look at how use of these approaches impacts on Medicare costs for different types of procedures. Um, there are some longitudinal surveys, some long-term surveys that have been looking at complementary use over time. Um, we know the, the MIDAS, the midlife in the USA study, has, uh, it's in its third wave. It's really looking at uh, psychological issues in, in the elderly, in the aging population, but it's also looked at whether complementary uh, therapies are used and the reasons for these use. And Wendy's asking this question because she and I are actually looking at these data to see if we can identify um, the trends in this population. Okay, uh, incredibly provocative, great set of analyses. Thank you, Richard. I really, really liked it. Thank you.